All right, here here it is. You knew it was coming, man. NASCAR is just feeding me content. I don't plan on cursing in this video, so feel free to, to, to listen to it at the gym, on your drive home, maybe have it in a side tab at work, whatever the case is. Feel free to listen. Feel free to grab a snack. We're going to be here for about half an hour talking about several things. Clearly, last night was the greatest show on television, to quote Chris Rock. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the tire issues. Ross Chastain, Blaney's window, feeling bad for NASCAR control. We'll explain that in a few. And uh, we're going to end with, we might actually start with it, but I do want to talk about, I don't think people understand how racetracks make money. And that's going to segue into, I think the, I think NASCAR fans are stupid. <laughs> like, not, oh man, they're jump like, oh, that, that's a dumb sport to be fans of. No, I fully believe that 60% of NASCAR fans, clearly not you guys, because you guys put money on the stuff, you guys listen to me, so you clearly are intelligent, but the vast majority of NASCARs are, NASCAR fans are idiots. Uh, we're going to open up with, they don't listen. It's wild. Now, I understand it's the all-star race. We got rules coming out of nowhere, coming out of the, the cracks in the walls, coming out of the hats and everything. But Mike Joy literally says on the last lap, remember, this race must end under green flag. It must end under green. If there is a caution, the race will be restarted. And then not 30 seconds later, Twitter is blowing up, be like, the race was official. They, they He saw the checkered flag. Driver, he, they, they're, they're, don't we all see the yellows? Like, that? that's the end of the race. You know, I understand the team's not knowing because I, I fully believe NASCAR did not inform the teams correctly. I'm pretty sure they just ran over it really quickly in the driver's meeting and then just never talked about it again. So I don't blame Blaney's team for reacting the way they did. I don't blame the teams react the way they did, but shame on you fans for literally sitting in front of your TV, hearing that Mike Joy just said the race will not end if there is a yellow and then complaining about that because that is the rule. Okay. We're, we're not arguing about the fact that this rule was dumb. I'm just explaining to you that if you were a student in school and the teacher literally just said one thing to not do, and then you go ahead and shove your finger into the pencil sharpener, and then you cry about it after they just said, don't do that, that's on you, you know? Anyway, it, it was the greatest show on on television. I was thoroughly entertained, and this was, this is me coming from a sense of I've hated the all-star race for years now, I find it boring. I, you know, I, I've advised don't put money on it, I've advised don't even waste your time watching it. Oddly enough, um, and I am going to put up reactions during this uh, probably tomorrow is that, you know, I had a league race. We were done. You know, we always go through and kind of, you know, joke around and laugh at each other in, in discord and, and, you know, watch Rex and stuff together from the race. And as we're watching, you know, our, our race ends and somebody comes over and be like, you you guys got to turn on the race. You know, Larson just blew a tire and we're like, oh, goody, let's check out this. Out. And we see Larson, you know, cream the wall and everything. And then, you know, obviously we see the, the Chastain and stuff. And I also had the, the race, on my stool over here while I was racing in the league race. So I'm, I at least watched it like, sure. I'm not interested in it, but I did watch it anyway. The, the tire issues is, is clearly there, but I don't, I, I truly yet again, don't believe that people understand what is happening with the tires that Goodyear is bringing because we're specifically seeing it at turns that are just very strenuous on the compound of the car. And I'm leaning towards, this hasn't been said, but I'm leaning towards this being an issue with the sidewall and not the actual contact patch on the track. You know, I don't know if you, here, we'll even kind of draw it real quick. Um, because when you have low air pressures, and I wish they would just show this on the screen, but when you have low air pressures, you know, the, the tire kind of balloons out. And so if this, if this straight part right here is, where are we at? If this is the rim... This is the rim. This is the rubber when it's deflated, you know, when it's underinflated, you know, whether it be at the start of a run, whether it be at the start of whatever the case is, lower tire temperature, whatever the case was. That's the issue that we're running into with lower um, air pressure. Now, there is an issue with the teams or some of the teams have been saying that they've been over inflating you know being overweight on some of the tires as well and so when that happens you end up ballooning and making the sidewall stretch even more and so you know let's let's kind of let's kind of draw this and get back to it you know when, when you over inflate the tire i gotta find this again when you over inflate the tire 
you know, the sidewalls basic, and this is like micro, you know, where the fibers are connected. The, the tire is stretched out more than what it should be. So both these situations damage and and poke little holes and stretches in the rubber in the in the uh, in the wall. This is the issue that Goodyear is running into. That's why we're seeing so many tire failures. So I just wish somebody would explain that as well. Like everybody running around like they have no idea what's causing the tire failures. That's what's it, or that's what I would lean to, and not necessarily the contact package coming apart. I, I fully believe it's it's right where the, you know, and it could be right where the seam is between. Um, where the, the end of the sidewall is and where the actual contact patch start. It could be ripping here as well, but I think the main issue is where the sidewall is. Um, I wish people would just talk about that. Uh, another point of, hey, this car was not ready. NASCAR clearly did, they gave, can't curse, they, they did not give a single rip towards this car, towards the, the development of this car. They just shoved it out there with no, with nothing ready. You know, the reason I, I retweeted uh, the video that was posted on YouTube of the next-gen test crash at Talladega is because I'm leaning towards that that's the crash test that the dummies came back being uh, being killed by. Because it looks like that gen the next-gen car was an older model from last year, and I tweeted this now about three, three weeks ago. But it's on, the, it's on YouTube, and I haven't seen anybody really talk about it. Um, but they have the crash test there. You know, and, and you're seeing that this car is, is pretty rigid. So, yet again, that's an issue. We're seeing all these drivers talk about, man, this is the hardest hit I've ever had because the car is rigid. All the impact is going to the driver. We're having the, the Goodyear issue, you know, and, and let's not just completely crap on Goodyear. NASCAR gave them, I'm not saying like, oh, let, Goodyear's completely in the green here, but imagine being the sole manufacturer of something and then you're hearing, you know, your your consumer being like, well, we're going to need a massive change here, a massive product change. Um, and you're like, well, I guess we got to develop this really quick. We've never really done anything. And that was one thing of, of yet again, when people were, I'm pretty sure this was the same tire compound that they ran at Kansas or whatever the case was. I don't remember exactly right now, last year. And people are like, why are these tires failing if it's the same way? Well, yeah, the, the compound's the same. The manufacturing and the construction of this tire is not the same. So people don't understand that. Um, but Goodyear, you know, really had like eight months to design this. And they never designed a tire like this. I'm not giving them, you know, I'm not giving them leeway. Like, clearly it's an issue. You know, blame Goodyear all you want. But that's another reason. So the next-gen car itself was not ready. Goodyear was not prepared for the loads and the issues that we would have here, not even mentioning the fucking tire, sorry, not even mentioning the tires falling off, and the, the issues we've had with the uh, center lock, the, the, the center locking nut that we've seen, but, uh, you know, that's that, you know, basically this is just a big old victory lap for me saying this car was not ready, and I'll probably post the image of this car was not ready as the thumbnail of this, uh, who knows, I might do that. Uh, anyway, let's talk about Ross Chastain. Or do you want to continue to talk about tires? So we did see Eric Jones blow a tire. We saw Stenhouse have multiple tire issues. We saw Kyle Busch, Kyle Larson, all these teams blowing tires. I still can't, I can't believe Blaney stayed out. Um, we'll talk about, you know, why, we'll talk about how, how the track works in a bit here at Texas. Um, but yeah, you know, Kyle Busch blowing that tire was, was incredible. And everybody's like, why did he just pull left? Well, one, he's trying to get out of the way. And two, when you blow the left rear tire on this stuff, it's not like you're blowing it on, on your street car or something. We've seen it time and time again this year that it, it just drops to the rim. You know, when these like, there is like, there's no, there's no warning for these tires fading. You know, it, it's, it's very much a, you know, it's fading, 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 fading. And then there's no like, oh man, you know, this is getting rough. It just blows like, that's just how it is. And so it blows to the rim, you know? And so Kyle Busch is clearly unable to control the car. I'm not I'm not blaming Kyle for turning left. I'd do the same thing, get the heck out of the way. You don't want to be by the wall because when you're coming out of the travel, you're by the wall. That's why he pulled left. Chastain made a bad move and he made himself. But uh what an amazing car, man. This next gen car is awesome. We we're taking all the best, we're taking all the worst qualities of open wheel cars and shoving it on this car yet again surrounded by styrofoam. Um, you clearly see that Chastain just blow through, he blows through the left rear quarter of this car, goes wheel to wheel contact with the car, with the tire that's already blown out and nearly flips over, which we got robbed of a Texas barrel roll into the outside wall. Very similar to the Arca, Arca crash this season at Talladega when 
that gentleman, you know, when we had the big wreck, uh, when we also had the, the ARCA break that injured somebody, I still don't know if he's injured or not. Hopefully he's just dead, so we don't have to deal with that anymore. But very similar wrecks there to where these cars are so close to just barrel rolling. It, it, it's it's like a tease, man. It's teasing us. It, it, it's showing us the possibility, and then it's, it's robbing us from that stuff. Um, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. When, when I saw the chalk get taken out in, in one full wreck, you know, I, I only played one line, and uh, my my stupid brain was like, you know what, I'm just going to fade Kyle Busch. I'm going to fade Kyle Larson. I'm going to fade Ross Chastain. Who else? Could, I'm going to fade Chase Elliott. Har- Hamlin's going to be the only chalk play I play. So I couldn't believe it when I saw them wrecked there, which is why, yet again, like... I feel so bad for you. If you played this, if you played the race right, if you played Kyle Busch, you got screwed under no fault of your own. You did everything correct. You played the guy that you should have played. You know, there's a reason those guys were popular. They were the plays. I, I can't even like be mad. I would be absolutely tilted, you know, and that's why I said, don't put a lot of money on this or don't play it. You know, oddly enough, it was one of my best return on investment of single entries that I've done. And I only put 75 bucks in, um, between DraftKings, Super, whatever the case was. Can't believe we got lucky there. But the fact that Chastain went up and clip, clipped Elliott was hilarious. Um, did you guys notice whenever Elliott spun and hit the wall, he just threw debris through the fence and, and hit the the stands that were cleared for like the, the ads and everything? Just another thing of like, I thought that was quite entertaining if, if they still had people there. Uh, hopefully somebody would have been lacerated by something. Um, but yeah, that was, that was incredible. And so when I saw that, I was like, okay, this all-star race is clearly more entertaining than I thought it was. And at this point I'm regretting not driving the four hours to this track to be in person for this event, to, to, to witness this whole thing that that's going on real quick. I gotta check my phone. And so, um, I'm like, all right, cool. Not, nothing else can clearly go wrong here. Um, or not, nothing can top this, you know, NASCAR truly is, is, is lining the track with uh, landmines and stuff. It's like if you played a video game and you turn the injuries up to 200% to where every play there's somebody being injured. Same thing here. It's like you just turn the tire wear up, you know, at this track. You may you go to a boring track. It's like, okay, how can we adjust this? Let's just bring, you know, <laughs> let's bring tires that fail left and right. Um, I love it. Couldn't have been happier. Let's talk about the Blaney window or do you want to talk about the caution We'll talk about the uh, we'll talk about the window that'll segue to us, you know, feeling bad for race control, which I think you really should do. Let's let's give them where uh, let's not be as harsh on race control as possible. But anyway, Blaney's window yet again. I don't blame the teams for not knowing. I doubt NASCAR informed them correctly, but the fans shame on you for being like, "What do you mean the race isn't over? The yellow came out, blah blah blah." So anyway, you know, Blaney's there, he's he's done doing his window, and this is something that, now I haven't worked with like a two-latch window net before, but I have sat in race cars, and not like, oh, I mean, I've done it too, of like, hey, let's sit in Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s car and flip off the cameraman, you know, I've done that before, uh, but like, in, sitting in an actual um, race car, I've done it with like, you know, basic window nets, but I understand the premise of a two-latch two latch system and even the ones that the modifieds we had you know are it's system to where when you're strapped in with a you know five point harness you can't really move a ton sure you can reach the window net and pull it back in the way that we just the way that ours was is it just has a single rod and a spring that when you pull back on it it will release the the front part and you can pull the window net down but it's incredibly difficult if you're strapped in to put the window net on by yourself you can, you know, I can't imagine doing that while you're actually driving usually. And that's another thing. Most racetracks, you know, if they see you with the window net down and it's clearly you didn't do that on purpose and it's under caution or something, they'll either black flag you to get off the track to put the window net back on. Or if it's under yellow, they'll just say, hey, can you stop at the bottom of turns two right now? And we'll send our officials out there and put your window net back up. It's not that difficult um, for, for the official to go over there and just put the window net up. It, it's very easy. You know, and so the fact that not only do, does NASCAR have the two, I believe it's the two um, latch system, they also have a piece of Velcro that tightens the window net that comes down on the outside lane. And that's why you see all the crew members at the very end of the, at the very start of the races, you know, put that on there. 
You know, I think people are are are, are really not understanding the importance of a window net. I d yet again, I think the half the half of the fans are idiots. Um, but when when you sit down and, and look at the safety feature of window net, I don't think people understand like the immense safety that it does. JD McDuffie died because you know. Um, Stuff flew in from his passenger window. We've seen, you know, multiple accidents this year and of and of late that you know this this body comes apart. You know, this car comes apart. We're seeing jags of sheet metal and pieces of metal from the suspensions just flying off. You know, God forbid you yeah you, you destroy the diffuser, you just got that flying all over the place. I mean, these cars are creating tons of debris. And it's not necessarily a case of that window net stopping it from that type of stuff, or it's not the case of, well, he has a helmet on, he's going to be fine. You know, hey, talk talk to IndyCar about, you know, helmet contacts with uh, with objects, you know, Justin Wilson. Uh, yeah, that's his name, Justin Wilson. And uh, I can't think of other people who have died at the play. I apologize, I just can't, I can't think of anything at the moment. Um, but, you know... Helmets are are great technology, but it, it it's wild that they're just not the end all be all when it comes to things flying at you going 180 miles an hour, you know. And and so the fact that you know, one that NASCAR is like uh, he's fine it is a blatant like you you cannot play ignorance when you're an intelligent organization when you know you know like I can't I can't believe. People accepted the 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 tweet. I'll bring it up here in a second. Um, but the fact that, like, look, Blaney's strapped in, and you cannot move. Like, this is as much as you can move your head when you're in the cocoon. You can't move your arm. It's like me with this microphone. If I had a thing right here that I had to move, I, I can't. I'm obstructed. It's going to be very difficult to do that. And imagine doing that and not even being able to move my hands, you know? The fact that that window net is so intricate... And that the only thing the only thing that the driver can do is literally take it down quickly because it's designed that way. It's designed to be put on from the outside and removed from the inside quickly. You know, here, let me let me bring this tweet up really quick because I could not believe that people just accepted this. I've already seen, you know, the NASCAR YouTubers. Fantastic. I mean, look, this is a situation where I'm going to be watching content because I just I love situations that NASCAR I, I love. When NASCAR loses legitimacy, legitimacy, legit, you know what I mean? Uh, and what did I text Pierce? I, I sent Pierce some, and I don't normally text Pierce during races and stuff. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I love when NASCAR loses credibility on an easy call of both the caution and, and Blaney's window net. But let's, let's find this right here. Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, I love it now. Blaine, I haven't even seen this. Brist, uh, Briscoe. Um, where where are we at? I can't. Did they delete it? Hold on. Let me look for this. Here we go. Here. So clearly this, you know, I'm not saying that. Uh, let's get this here. Hold on. Um, this this right here is 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 incredible. Ladies and gentlemen, let, let's bring the. In. Incredible, ladies and gentlemen, blatant, absolute lying. I love it. Can't respect an organization more than just lying through their teeth. It, it's unbelievable. And yet again, the NASCAR fans who see this and, and like, oh, well, I guess they, you know, bad call on them. They thought it was lat. B BS, dude, there's a rod that goes in and out of the window nets that has to be latched on the front with two latches. The only thing Blaney did was use that Velcro strap and, like, put it around the the frame, the, 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 the cage of the car on the top. That's all he did. You can see it in black and day. I love it. And they're like, well, he had both hands on the... Well, no, what do you think he's going to do? Don't use that. Come on now. Come on, man. Come on, that's like holding a baby under the water in a in a swimming pool for like four minutes, and be and look, his eyes were still open. I thought he was breathing. Like he he turned blue. I thought that was what babies do. Like it's clearly like NASCAR knew they know that Blaney cannot latch that, and it's not being like oh well NASCAR the execs are so removed. 
they're not like that. That is basic info for anybody who's ever been around a race car. You know, this is not some fa Scotty Miller isn't some fan. You know, he's not some dumb redneck who's like, I, I don't know. I guess NASCAR is, I guess they know what they're doing. A blatant lie right here. They absolutely knew it wasn't latched. And, you know, I guess NASCAR is a huge fan of Accept because they are just restless and wild when it comes to safety. I I can't believe it, man. They, uh, I, um, we literally took steps back. The fact that a safety feature, which has been in, in, in NASCAR for years, it, it's crazy. They just said, nah, you know what? It's going to be fine. That safety net was probably held together uh, probably less tighter than my double-sided tape holding all my uh, sound foam on the wall. Because you can see it move once it gets up to speed. It just kind of moves down. Now, sure, it catches, but in a wreck, it, it doesn't do anything there. We've seen it multiple times that people are black flag or chewed out. Uh, we've had people not qualify for the Daytona 500 because of a loose window net. We've had people get chewed out in practice running by themselves because of a window net falling down. We've had people be black flagged under green for a window net coming down. We've had people be black flagged under green for having... Yet again, what's up with the safety hatches, man? We're having the safety hatches have run into a lot of issues as well. But we've had people black flagged under the race because, you know, this, the roof hatch, you know, comes loose or something like that. Like, it, it's, it's, it's wild that... NASCAR decided to just, you know, say screw it, um, with the with the window net. I I loved it, man. It, they just kept on doubling down on a bad call. It I love. That's what I mean. Like NASCAR loves to double down on bad calls. They're like, hey Phil, you think we can? That's kind of dangerous, right? Yeah, but he's got a helmet. Let's just run it. Out of all, it's like if you if you're playing a game or you're 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 playing, you know, I want to win. What is it? I want to be a millionaire or something. And they give you four questions. And like the last question is, is the last answer is clearly a, a, a dumb question. All the other options are like, you know, black flag him, um, bring him down pit road, allow him to keep his position, you know, cause this is an instant that, you know, he was unaware of. He put the, you know, he, he started taking the window net down or, go in the sense of we're really going to black flag him because we told him the rule that if the yellow comes out, you know, on the white flag, the race is not over. Blaney blatantly disregarded that rule out of all the options they took. They're just like, nah, we're going to keep him there. And so all the people who are also crapping on Denny Hamlin and basically telling Denny Hamlin to go, you know, hang himself or something like Hamlin is right. What are you talking about? Hamlin, you cannot race a man who is lacking one of the most important safety devices in a race car. I'm not lying when it's literally, imagine Blaney took his Hans device off in the car, threw it to the side. You'd be like, wow, that guy's crazy. What the hell is he doing? It's the same thing. It's it's the same exact thing. If if Blaney, and I'm not saying it's instant death, but the amount of the 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 chance of injury increases dramatically when you just have the window there, you know, and that's basically what it was. Sure, the net was there. It's not going to catch anything. It's not going to do anything. You know, we've seen it multiple times of 500 finishes to where, you know, people get in the wall, people have debris fly off the window net, you know, <laughs> like if, 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 uh, if Blaney gets spun and, and hits the wall, like Chase Elliott does driver's side of the wall and throws stuff towards the catch fence, you're going to have stuff ricocheting back into the car. You know, I'm not saying it's instant death and it's not, I'm not even saying, oh, he's going to, you know, be injured from the head, but you get stuff flying in, cut your arms or you get knocked out. Not, and then, I mean, this is a lot of ifs and, and I understand why people are like, Brandon, you know, you say this all the time. Nobody does. You know, you, we're pushing the envelope. I love it. Imagine if Blaney gets knocked out for whatever reason, his hand flies out the, the window. You know, I'm not saying it could go out a long way, but it flies out and he loses fingers or something like just... NASCAR truly just went back in time. I love it. Yet again, another reason why, you know, this year's Daytona 500 first race I've ever felt truly alive and felt fearful for people, for the fans. Loved it. Felt alive. This race here felt alive. We don't know who's going to blow tires. We don't know who's going to get wrecked. Yada, yada, yada. And so the fact that, you know, Blaney's window net is why that was even an issue it, it it's beyond me i just loved the chaos it just kept feeding 
into this night. I mean, at this point, I'm I'm locked in this race. It's the greatest all-star race I've ever seen. And I'm not saying that jokingly. I was thoroughly entertained the last... When I tuned into the all-star race, I was entertained because it was a mess. Let's feel bad for race control. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're at a job... Now, I understand some of you guys are successful, but let's kind of think back of, of when, you know, say we're working retail or something, and we got bosses clearly above us. And... The bosses are like, all right, cool. Look, we're going to implement this new rule. This We want this race to end under green, which secondly, which firstly should be a rule everywhere. I am on board on the ARCA rules of the race ends under green. I don't care if it's a one lap shootout. The, the race should never, ever end under yellow. Indy car F1, you guys need to end these, these races under green. I hate when a racing series ends under yellow. It's ridiculous. Secondly, race control is clearly being told by NASCAR because we've seen it this year of when they're on the button. You know, think of the truck race at Daytona. They're like there. They got the finger on the trigger. They're just they're just waiting. They're just waiting. They're just like, is anything going on? Is anyone inside? Hit it! Just bam! And they, they, they have the finger on the trigger. I... You got to respect them for that. They're being told, listen, we want these races to end under green. We want restarts here. Texas needs restarts here. Please throw a yellow if you see anything that could result in a yellow. However, if it's the truck series race and Blaine Perkins gets spun, literally spun, yeah, we're not going to do that. If somebody spins on the, if somebody, if Hamlin blows a transmission on the inside of turns one and two, I'll let him sit there for two laps. You know, ah, if, if Spencer Boyd breaks his uh, shoulder, uh, on the back straight at Las Vegas, yeah, I keep him there. You know, that doesn't matter. But here in this race here, somebody even gets out of the groove. We're throwing that yellow. And so clearly, you know, I'm not saying Stenhouse was a yellow, but I would much rather have yellows for every little thing than never just because it's entertaining. But anyway, the race control guys are being told by the top of the top, tippity top of the mountain. You know, if you're talking Dr. Disrespect, they're at the tippity top and they're only halfway up. You know, there's people above them telling, look, if somebody gets sideways, throw a yellow. So that's what they do. And NASCAR threw them under the bus. NASCAR gave them orders. NASCAR gave them a clear objective that if there's a yellow or if there's anything that looks like it, throw it. We cannot have this race end in a boring fashion. That's why we manufactured this, the, the race the way it is. That's why we had the competition caution halfway through the last stage. If, if there's no yellow, we need restarts. We need action. We need to pack, you know, interest in this race. They do it. The officials did their job based on NASCAR's orders to throw the yellow at the end of the race. Was it a bad call? Yes. Were, are they just following orders? Yes. Did somebody get chewed out in the race control because they saw somebody sideways? NASCAR has been telling them all week, if there's something on the last lap because we can't do it, throw a yellow here. They throw a yellow. And I guarantee you they're being chewed out or they're just removed from that position. So that's bad. They, they're put, they were put in a no-win situation. So, uh... That's where I'm at, you know, truly, I'm trying to look at different ways to look at this stuff and, and the race official, yeah, they messed up clearly, but it's because they have so much pressure. They got a gun at the back of their head, pull the yellow flag, the lights out. If that happens, secondly, yet again, people don't listen or people, you know, Mike Joyce says 20 seconds before it happens, this race has to end under yellow. We clearly see the yellow lights on before Blaney reaches the checkered flag. It's not even close. Like it was at Daytona in the truck series. He's not even there, ladies and gentlemen. Unless you're colorblind and not seeing the color yellow, the race was not official, okay? Um, entering the final restart, you know, I'm in team speak, and I'm, I, we're talking to my boys, my my friends, my, my Winstell gang guys, and I'm like, I want to see Blaney get turned. Let's wreck Blaney. Wreck him. Don't let Blaney win. I would have, the night would have only been better if Blaney didn't win the all-star race. If he got, if he finished second or better, got wrecked, it might've been the greatest race I've ever seen in my life. Could have been the best thing ever. Um, but yeah, so that's that. Um, let's talk about how a track makes money. I talked about a bit in the live show, but you know, not a lot of people were there. And, and if you're still here listening 30 minutes in, I really do appreciate you. Um, tracks make money based on the TV deals and really, you know, clearly, I mean, they get sponsorships from the stuff, but their main source of income is ticket sales. Okay. Ticket sales, ladies and gentlemen. So when we look at why they reconfigured Texas, because 
They're tra- there's too at the time there's too many cookie cutter tracks. That's all we were doing. We we're trying to to beef up the mile and a half program. Well, they changed turns one and two, and I've talked about it before that you know I don't know why the mentality is if you change one corner, you know some teams will set up for this corner, some teams will set up for the other corner. No, everybody just sets up for the fastest part of the track, and everybody sets their car up for turns three and four, and you just take whatever you can get at one and two. I don't know why that was even designed that way. Either way, that happens. They you know they put millions into reconfiguring the track. At the time, they were like, okay, that's fine. We're, we're, we're different from the mile and a half. But at this point, we've lost Chicagoland. We've, got, we've lost Kentucky. You know, and we're, we're dwindling down on the cookie-cutter tracks. We'll talk a bit about Chicagoland and Kentucky in a second. Um, but, you know, they put millions into the renovation. They're trying to, to save that. They're trying to save the, the value they put in there. They're not going to destroy Texas. They're not going to leave Dallas Fort Worth area. Everybody being like, oh, they need a road course in Dallas. Everybody, they need to build another racetrack. They had another racetrack and they said, mm, you know, College Station, College Station was a pretty bad place for Texas World. We'll just get rid of Texas World. We have Texas Motor Speedway. We have that property there. Um, I'm not saying IMS is saying that. I'm saying that like looking at tracks that could host NASCAR race, it was clearly head to head between Texas Motor Speedway and Texas World. They made their choice. They have the property. They can reconfigure Texas again. The reason they haven't done it is because they don't know what they want to do to the track. It would have been, it would have made more sense to do what they did to Atlanta to Texas. It just didn't end up that way. Atlanta would have been a perfect place to go back and just repave it and have it be the mile and a half, and then build Texas as a high bank mile and a half track. You know, clearly they didn't do that, and they're going to do something to Texas. They're not going to not keep coming here. The location is too is 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 awesome. They already have way more infrastructure there at Texas to facilitate a track more than any place. It would be stupidly expensive to start at a new place. And anyway, when they, they're going to say if they do a renovation at the track and they reconfigure turns one and two or whatever they end up doing, say it costs, let's say, let's say they just reconfigure turns one and two. Let's give them a $4 million budget. Okay. You got $4 million there. How do you recoup that? Well, you build a track people actually want to go to. Let's use Phoenix as an example. And in terms of the attendance rate, I think Phoenix hosts 40,000 people and Phoenix sells out. I don't know why that's another badly designed track, um, but Phoenix sells out. The price, the, the tickets are not a hundred dollars, but let's say the average ticket price is a hundred bucks because you go higher. You're sometimes you're paying 130, 140, you go lower, you're paying 80, 70, whatever the case is. hundred dollar tickets are fine. We're not talking about the suites. We're not talking about the income from the TV side. We're not talking about anything else. Just pure ticket sales at a hundred dollars each for 40,000 people. That is $4 million. You know, Texas can easily recoup this. When you look at racetracks, they're investments that when it's an actual good weekend can bring in, and that's Phoenix. When it's the size of Texas, you're looking at closer to six, eight, ten, probably twelve million dollars on ticket sales. If it's a sold out pack and you're actually paying up for tickets, you can easily get there. You can make a crap load of money. And that's not even the ticket, uh, or that's not even the TV contract deal. That's not even the, the sponsors who want to be there. It's one of the most lucrative lucrative and profitable things imaginable, a sporting event in that. And that's not even considering, you know, beer sales and everything, because you're you're make your margins on the food and beer are still gonna you're gonna make profit there as well. Might not be as big, but when you're bringing in twelve, eight million dollars on ticket sales, you can take, you know, smaller margins on your food and beverage cost, you know? Um anyway. So they're they're going back to Texas. That that's just the situation. Okay, people don't understand that. People are like, you gotta blow up Texas. You gotta leave Texas. You gotta go do a road course. You know that that's that's not how it works. So people don't understand what makes a racetrack money. Because I would argue, I still think Texas is probably still profitable based on all the because it's in uh, the IMS. You know, family is it IMS or SMI? Don't remember, don't really care. But it's in that family. You know, they pull weight and money towards each track to make sure they're all profitable there. That's fine. Texas is not going away. Secondly, uh, do you know why we're not at Kentucky anymore? Do you know why we're not at Chicagoland anymore? Kentucky, and nobody talks about this, yet again, people don't do reporting. I mean, uh, let's see, I got about 15 minutes before I can 
go. Kentucky was a poorly run track. It was ran into the ground by the, uh, not ownership of the track, but the, the running of it. The, it was a mess. The board of directors, the, the chairman of the track, the track president, everybody involved making decisions. It was a clusterfuck. Sorry, I cursed twice here. Sorry about that. But it was. Nobody talks about that. There's no reporters going around of, why are we not at Kentucky? Oh, just, you know, fans didn't want to go. You know, it was just lost to the track. It was bad. People did not like going to it. Business people. I'm not talking about fans. I'm talking about within the NASCAR industry, people hated Kentucky. They did not like going there. They were not a fan of the how the track was ran, how it was used you know it was just continuous arguing for that track and it was unbearable for the industry to go there so yeah kentucky is a good track but if it's ran poorly if people don't like to do business with you it's not going to be there why is texas still on there because everybody at texas is fun to work with everybody understands that look Texas Speedway is a bad track. We're trying to do all we can here where kentucky was just rude to work with that's why it's not on the schedule anymore that's why it's not there. Chicagoland. Chicagoland was removed because of the same reason. However, they were more friendly. And I'm giving inside information right now. I don't like, I don't know why people don't report on this stuff. It's not that hard. You just have to talk to people. Like Bob, hey, hey uh, David Smith, uh, Chris, Chris Gluck, Chris Gluck, Jeff Gluck. You know, if you want to do real reporting, just go ask people why aren't they at these tracks and don't just take NASCAR's word for it. I can tell you that. Kentucky was terrible to work with. People did not like going there. People did not like working there within NASCAR. Chicagoland. Chicagoland wanted to come back, but the state and everything during COVID didn't want sporting events. They didn't want it. COVID killed Chicagoland. That's really what it did. Chicagoland is still on the track or still able to come back. At the moment, you know, clearly they're building warehouses near there. But it's the same situation with other tracks, like Nashville has warehouses built there. They're, just, they're selling off some of the property, but they're not selling off the track because guess what? You're able to make a lot of money at Chicagoland. It, it, it's very lucrative to keep that track there, especially after we haven't had races in a while. The turnout going there should be good. Look at the return to Nashville, Super Speedway. People showed up left and right for a crappy race, but it's because people want the race there. So that's how you build... That's why you build tracks. That's how you make money at these racetracks. Like, why aren't we talking about that more and more? So everybody out there being like, man, Texas sucks, which it does, but it can easily be renovated and fixed. But people talking about, yeah, just removed from the schedule. They would be, they would be idiots to do that. The Dallas Fort Worth area is one of the best places to have a sporting event. You have millions of people within driving distance, not even a full day driving distance, within a few hours. If you do a full circle of like a three hour drive, because I'm four hours away, that's not even including me. If you do a full circle of a three hour drive, you have millions of people who want to go to races who can easily go to Texas Motor Speedway. So Texas is not going away. It just depends on when they bite the bullet to reconfigure the track. That's all we're waiting for. One thing that they could do if they don't want to just reconfigure turns one and two is just build a grip strip in turns one and two. And what I mean by that is just pave, just put new pavement, you know, from the second lane up. Try that for a year. See if it doesn't have, if it doesn't work right off the bat. Oh, but Brandon, that's the same as PJ1. Uh, no, it's not, driver. No, it's not. Fresh asphalt would provide far more grip and it's not going to disappear like crazy the I, I talked about it too much in the live show um but the, the the design of turns one and two just doesn't work or keep it that way and add progressive banking i hate progressive banking but good god turns one and two at texas is literally designed for progressive banking and i'm not talking about some crappy two degree increase i'm talking about going from I'm, I'm assuming we'll probably have like what 14 degrees of banking in turns one and two and i'm talking about going up to like 20 21 degrees like have it be a gigantic increase and because the the turn is so long you can make it to where it because the issue with progressive banking tracks is you end up making if it's a cookie cutter track you end up making the top line dominant 
But if you have such a gigantic difference in distance, you can make it work. And Texas, that, that's the saving grace there. So you can either keep Texas the way it is and add aggressive progressive banking or just reconfigure terms one and two. I assume that's what they're going to end up doing because the old Texas was great. You know, it wasn't the greatest track, but it was it was put on decent racing. And uh, yeah, that, that's my argument for, you know, educating idiots on how these stupid racetracks make money and how you can be profitable and why Texas is still on the track, you know, uh, I, and also, real quick for DFS, Texas in the fall, outside of the tire issues, should be one of the best days for DFS ever. You got the short tracks that nobody can pass on. You got Texas that nobody can pass on. You can easily project for those tracks. I'm looking forward to Texas in the fall for DFS. Um, and that's that's really it. I was going to rant about how people were bitching that Greg Abbott was at the track. Uh, and then I think people also forget that you have governors multiple governors, multiple past governors in Arizona go to the track in Arizona. You have other government officials go to other government tracks. But Brandon, it's it's only Republicans. You know, that's an issue. That's a political statement. NASCAR said that they wouldn't design. You can't just go to a track. You guys are looking to do it too much. Now, granted, yes, like Trump going to the Daytona 500, clearly a play for votes, but it's the president. You know, anytime a government official goes to an event, it, 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 adds morale you know to either the city the country whatever the case is the state like the fact that hey you know i'm at this racetrack oh i got a government official there i mean they're lying pos's anyway but hey at least they're here with me you know they're trying to be with the people um so that was my last little rant there is that you know twitter was yet again blowing up that abbott was at the track you know <laughs> like what are you guys talking about you guys looking at this way too much man Hell, Adolf Hitler could have showed up to the track and I'd be like, hey, man, that's pretty cool. <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. But thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you later in the week for some reactions. Or I'll post the reactions later this week. And clearly we got content for Coca-Cola 600 coming up. So thank you for listening and we'll see you later.